Welcome to our ongoing Lenten journey here at Spearfish United Methodist Church. We're glad that you've chosen to join us online. You're welcome to join us anytime in person as we do have our three services on Saturday evening at 5.30 on Sunday morning at either 9 o'clock or 10.30. And uh, next week we'll be moving back to our uh, our church over at uh, the United Methodist Church in Spearfish. So we're glad you're here tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about raising from the dead and uh, how Jesus does things that encourage us to believe in him despite some of our boundaries and barriers that we have to belief. So we're glad that you're here. Enjoy the worship service. <laughs> close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, and make me wholly devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to first scripture is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen waiting for the morning. More than watchmen waiting for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Let's pray. Lord, we have come a long way on our journey. For so many of us, we know where the scriptural road will take us and we will walk triumphantly into Jerusalem, eat a supper meal with Jesus and watch as he is taken from the garden and brought before the authorities. We will weep at the foot of the cross as he speaks words of love and forgiveness and we will wail at the tomb. We don't like this part of the journey, and we'd just as soon skip it. But here we have the story of his friend, Lazarus, who has died. His sisters, Mary and Martha, have confidence that he could have been healed, but they do not think that he can be raised from the dead. And that is part of our problem, too. We want to have confidence in the healing, restorative power of Jesus, but we cannot escape our fear of our arch enemy, death. Jesus' proclamation of eternal life is real. We need to let go of our fear for life in eternity is also God's promise, a home with God. Can we come out of our darkness? Can we risk believing in Jesus? These are hard questions and cannot be answered without a trip to Jerusalem, to the cross and to the tomb. This is our Lenten journey. So God, we ask you, please be with us on this journey. 
For we pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. gospel scripture comes from John 11, verses 1 through 45. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this story of Lazarus is a familiar story and we've heard it many times. We know that everything comes down to the wire. Someone's life is at stake. It's all on the line. It's kind of like a television program. And, uh, you know, the hero is going to show up. Someone has to come and do something to save the day. Otherwise, our hero or heroine will not make it. And just in time, we have a commercial. Now, just in time, the hero arrives. And our story from Scripture begins in a similar manner. If you want to follow along, I'm going to be in John chapter 11. It was all just read for you, but I want to give us some highlights of that. You find that Lazarus is sick, that uh, some messengers come. They want Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. And for some reason, Jesus, uh, in verses 6 and 7, it becomes an altogether different story from the hero story that we're used to. We're used to the hero responding by showing up on the scene and making a change. Jesus hears about what's happening with Lazarus and waits two more days before heading to help Lazarus. And then it becomes an altogether different story. What I want to look at is three different groups in this story. And the story begins with the first group, which is Jesus and his disciples. Now, these disciples have been Jesus' students for two, maybe even three years by this point. And so they know Jesus and have spent more time with Jesus than anyone else. But in verses 7 through 16, we find that, that these disciples are fearful for the Lord's Savior, for the Lord's safety. But Jesus assures them that they have nothing to fear, that there's nothing that can be done to him. And they're unsure of the Lord's intentions, but Jesus assures them that the events that will come are not going to challenge their belief, but fortify their belief. And Thomas comments where he says, let us go to Jerusalem with him. We might as well die with him. Kind of show a lingering pessimism about Jesus' mission. The question we have as we look at this is why didn't they fully believe Jesus? And the reason that the disciples didn't fully believe in Jesus, because Jesus tells them, I I do these things in order that you might believe, that suggests that they don't fully believe at this point. Well, why didn't they fully believe Jesus? It's because they didn't fully understand Jesus. 
It's similar to the situation that we looked at with Pastor Randy last week with the man born blind. There was a situation where the disciples just did not understand what was going on. They asked Jesus, who was it that sinned? And they didn't understand that this was going to be glorifying to God and lead to belief. But then again, you know, who among us fully understands Jesus can say that we know Jesus and we know how he's going to respond. Because if we start to think that way, if we start to think we've got Jesus nailed down and put in a box, we sometimes think that we know what God is up to. And then the question is, can we be surprised by what God does? The second group is Mary and Martha, and their unbelief was due to their grief. They were so grieved by the passing of their brother and so frustrated with Jesus that Jesus had not shown up in time to save him, that their unbelief was caused by their grief and perhaps even by their anger. You remember from earlier in the story that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were all Jesus' friends. Then we find in verses 17 through 21 that Jesus is asked twice. He says, um, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And we kind of see this as a nice story of Mary and Martha, that they believe in Jesus, that they're Jesus' friends, they're, that, that they realize what Jesus is going to do. And I wonder, what were Mary and Martha really saying to Jesus? And I think it's more like this. Where were you? What on earth was more important than coming and healing Lazarus? You're a day late and a dollar short. That's, I think, their attitude as they come to Jesus. They still love him, but they're very frustrated with him. Very frustrated that he allowed their brother to die by not coming and saving him in time. And he, notice that they say, if you had been here. And what they note in that statement is a perceived sense of God's absence. God was absent to them in their time of need. Which raises the question for us and for them, is God only present when things are going well? Do we say, I'm blessed only when my financial situation is doing well, when my children are all succeeding in life? When all is going well, when I'm feeling well, is that when God is present? Well, if you read through the scripture, you find that that's not the message that you find in the Bible. It would take another sermon to really look at that, but just know that God is present even in difficult times. God is present as a comfort to us in our grief. God shows up for Martha and Mary in the time of their grief. So we have to ask, was God absent at the death of Lazarus? If he would have been there, would he have been able to save Lazarus? Well, if you think about it, Jesus really didn't have to be there. There are other stories of long-distance healings that Jesus does. And so it's not about absence. It's about something else that Jesus is up to. We find in verse 22, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then in verse 22, she says, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. There's a sense in the midst of her anger, her frustration with Jesus, that she even then maintains and retains her faith. Now, I want to say something about that. Sometimes we're afraid to be angry with God. And I think that's the wrong attitude, that we need to be able to express our anger to God. If you're wondering if it's okay to express our anger with God, then read through the Psalms. What you find is regularly that, that the psalmist will write about how God is so good, but in the present circumstances, it seems like God is not good. And the psalmist says, my circumstances are horrific, but I know that eventually you're going to save me. I just wish it was yesterday and not tomorrow. So 
Martha retains her faith, and in verse 23 through 27, she states a complete recognition of who Jesus is. Yes, Lord, she says in verse 27, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. We can hold that statement along with the statement, if you had been here, this would not have happened. Our anger, our, our, sometimes even our doubt, is not a sign that we have lost our faith or lost our belief. It seems despite her sorrow and even her anger with Jesus, Martha retains her belief. A third group that I want to look at in this story, we find in verses 28 through 37. And this is the crowd. See, a crowd gathers at the scene of a death or at the scene of a funeral. They followed Mary, but they sure weren't quite sure why they were following Mary to hear what Jesus had to say. After all, Jewish funerals were crowded and noisy affairs. They often had hired mourners who would come in and just wail and cry and make noise. That's what we find in verse 33. Jesus sees her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. And he was moved in his spirit and troubled. The crowd has kind of a mixed idea of what is happening. Some of the crowd says, see how he loved him when Jesus weeps. And the other part of the crowd says, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? The crowd has two wings to it. Much like even today, we have polarization between one who believes one thing and another who believes the other. The crowd is mixed. No one is quite sure what will happen, but they're more than willing to stand around and see. There's a lack of commitment among these people. And then you have the miracle that leads to belief. As Jesus says, open up the tomb. Oh, Lord, but there's a stench. And Jesus says, open it up and calls Lazarus to come. Now, does anybody know how many people were in the tomb with Lazarus? Anybody? At least three. And do you know why I say at least three? Because if you read in the King James Bible, it says, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah, very good. I like the hiss. <laughs> so Jesus was a funeral director's worst nightmare. I mean, think about it. Oops, we've lost the corpse. There's no dead guy. Well, then there's not going to be a funeral. The funeral director has a nightmare about this because if there's no funeral, then there's no invoice to give to the family to collect for the charges of the funeral. And I imagine that... After this happened a couple of times, because you find that it d does happen, he restored this young man that was, that was dead, that was being carried along, and has restored him to his mother. You have Lazarus here. It seems like wherever Jesus goes, the dead don't stay dead. And so I imagine that funeral directors began to map funeral routes in their future to avoid running into Jesus. Let's make this guy stay dead because we're running out of, you know, we're not getting any money here when these folks are, are doing this. But in verses 38 and 39, it's obvious that Martha was unaware of Jesus' plans. You find in verse 38 and 39 that, uh, excuse me, I got the same problem that Kevin had with pages sticking together. That Jesus comes to the tomb and says, take away the stone. And she wonders what's going on. Does, does he just want to get one more glimpse of Lazarus? Does he just want to go into the tomb and see his face? And then you have verse 40, which I think is the bottom line of this entire passage. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? That's a powerful statement. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. 
You see, if we don't believe, then we assign all sorts of things to what happens in the world. We say that that was just luck. That was just circumstances. That was just too bad. We don't have any control over our lives, nor does God have any control. But here it says, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Belief is a word that appears often in the Gospel of John. In fact, it appears 85 times in the Gospel of John, only 32 in all three of the other Gospels. And I don't mean 32 in each of them. I mean all three of the Gospels. You run into the word believe 32 times, 85 times in one Gospel of John. And so almost 40% of its occurrences in the whole New Testament are in John's Gospel. One book. That includes Paul's letters. It includes the book of Revelation, Hebrews. 40% of the occurrences of the word believe show up in John's gospel. And so you might say that belief is a little bit important to the gospel of John. John begins his gospel by telling us that all who believe in the name of Jesus are given the right to become the children of God. Notice it's those who believe. And John then tells us in chapter 6 that the work God expects from us is that we believe in Jesus, the one whom he has sent. I want to say that belief is more than just up here. Belief also impacts my heart and my hands. If I believe what God is telling me, I am going to do what God is asking me to do. And then in verses 41 through 44, you see that Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, which is really, honestly, no favor to Lazarus. I mean, it's a favor to all the people around him, but it's not a favor to Lazarus because he had already died, and now he would have to die eventually a second time. In fact, not only that, but once he dies, you find in chapter 12 that the that, that after Lazarus' book on his... Well, let me just read those verses for you here. In chapter 12, you find, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he has raised from the dead. So look at this. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So once Lazarus' book on his after-death experiences hit the bestseller list, then the chief priest got wind of it and they put a contract out on him. So it's really no favor to Lazarus to raise him from the dead. So why the miracle then? And the miracle is because of what we read way back in verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Glorification, you need to know, that glorification for Jesus, as you read through the Gospels, is not praise and adoration. Glorification for Jesus means death and resurrection. And the story of the raising of Lazarus is the point of no return for Jesus in John's gospel. It's the turning point. Jesus can't go back and just be a healer and a preacher and someone who brings good news. Now that he has raised someone from the dead, it means it's going to lead to the cross. And so to strengthen the disciples' belief and prepare them for his own resurrection after which everything would make sense, This is why Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. The reason Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead is to strengthen Martha and Mary's belief by showing compassion to them in their time of grief. And the reason that Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead is to separate the committed out of the crowd by doing something that removed all doubts. And near the end of John's Gospel, He gives us the purpose for recording Jesus' miracles. He says, These are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
Notice that the response by the Pharisees and by the Jewish religious leaders is we've got to kill them both now. It's gone from bad to worse. So I want to bring up a fourth group, which is different from the other three. You remember we looked at the disciples who struggled because they weren't sure who Jesus was. They didn't have Jesus all figured out. The ladies, because they were blinded by their grief and perhaps by their anger. And the crowd, which just really wasn't willing to make a commitment to follow Jesus one way or the other. Well, now you have a fourth group that's different from those three. And that fourth group we find in the final section of chapter 11, and it's in the reaction of the religious leaders. You see, the religious leaders aren't really concerned about whether they're going to believe Jesus or not. What they believe in is their own selves, their own power, their own interpretation of Scripture. And what they're concerned about is losing their authority. They are concerned also that the Romans are going to come, come and take away their power. In order to retain their positions, they are willing to kill the author of life. Now, with this group, I say it's different because it's not a lack of belief, but this is overt idolatry. They're putting themselves ahead of God. And so as we look at this passage, I wonder which group you might find yourself in today. Is it that you have a lack of understanding or a confusion about who Jesus is? Are you unsure of what Jesus is up to in your life or in the church? The answer is to believe and to follow Jesus and eventually it will make sense. When you read through the scriptures, when you read through the gospels, you find that the disciples really didn't get it until after the resurrection. Are you among those with Mary and Martha who are struggling with grief and perhaps even anger at God? Have your own losses and sufferings or the suffering you see throughout the world blinded you to Jesus' love? Does it seem like God is absent? Believe that God is with you in the tough times. Believe in God and in Jesus and you will see the glory of God. This world cannot be all that there is. God has some surprises in store for you in this life and in the next. Are you in that third group, the crowd, with a lack of commitment? Has the prevailing worldview caused you to doubt Jesus' power or perhaps even caused you to doubt his very existence? Have you bought into some alternate Christianity that is connected to nationalism or capitalism or liberalism or some other ism? I would encourage you just to believe in Jesus because then you will begin to see the glory of God. And hopefully none of you are in the category of the religious leaders from this story because their issue is idolatry and control. And this one, I think, strikes close to the heart, closer to the heart than we're often comfortable with. The question for us today is, do you know who Jesus is and yet you refuse to allow him lordship over your life? And my encouragement is to just get a clue because the tighter you hold on, the more control slips away. The tighter you try to grip control, the more you realize the control is not yours, but instead it's trust in God. And so give control to the one who can handle it. And so God gives new life in order that we might believe. That new life is possible and that God is the one who can give it. Dale Moody was a professor of systematic theology, and he was invited to speak at a vacation Bible school for children. I mean, talk about a mismatch here. We have a a professor of systematic theology, which are, they're pretty heavy hitters. I mean, they speak a lot of language, a lot of big words, um, incarnational theology, trinity, eschatology, pneumatology, soteriology, basically add up a lot of $3 words until you get to the ones you can't afford anymore. Well, these guys deal full-time with concepts 
that most of us don't have time to get close to even thinking about. Well, they asked Dale Moody to speak to this VBS, and in his talk, Moody chose to teach the children to sing a song from the Bible in its original Greek wording. Great idea. I think, you know, maybe we should do that this summer, teach Greek in VBS. <laughs> and since Moody, since he used such a, a simple and lively tune, one of the children was still singing it when she got home and found her father slumped in a chair, dead drunk. She went on singing, and soon her father woke up. And after a moment or two of listening, he was confused enough to ask her, what's that weird song you're singing? She replied, stretching out her hand and pointing to him, wake up, you sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. He was dumbfounded, not to say shocked, and he couldn't get over what his daughter had said to him. He asked where she had learned it and where it was found, and by the end of the week, he went to the church where his daughter had been and opened his life to the light of the world. You see, this man was raised from the dead, raised from death into new life by the power of God, directed through the faith of a child. You see, God raises the dead in order that we might believe in him. So as we see God bring new life each day, may God also give us the faith we need to believe in him. Amen.
And now may God bless you to be a community that comes to life with and for one another as God's breath of life sustains us on our journey. Amen.